thank you for gathering right now to celebrate Earth Day. I wanted to tell you that every year on Earth Day that the UN rings its peace bell. And I wanted to begin this 50th anniversary of Earth Day with what the intention, the vision was behind it with reading the original proclamation. So we'll start here. <laughs> Happy, happy Earth Day, fellow Earthlings. So this is the original Earth Day proclamation. Quote, all individuals and institutions have a mutual responsibility to act as trustees of the Earth, seeking the choices in ecology, economics, and ethics that will eliminate pollution, poverty, and violence that will foster peaceful progress, awaken the wonder of life, and realize the best potential for the future of the human adventure. So in the beginning of our exhibition, we quote the wonderful environmentalist and artist uh, Frederick Hunterwasser, and he says, you are a guest of nature, behave, you know. So um, let me, uh, wanted you to understand that this is just the very first teaser of, of a four part, because the exhibition, The Secret Life of Earth is so dense uh, and, and, and so glorious at the same time. And uh, uh, several of the key artists are right on with us today. And I hope that we get to hear from them, particularly if your questions uh, you know, relate to their works, et cetera. Um, one more thing I wanted to speak to you about um, is this idea of what is a 50th anniversary? Why is that so special? In many, many places, they call the 50th anniversary of anything a jubilee, a golden anniversary. And where does that, that sacred sense of something reaching its 50th anniversary come? Well, it goes back to the Bible. And the idea was very apropos to Earth Day. It was seven times seven years plus the one. And in the end of every seven year period, there were several things that happened that are terrific. Uh, you had to let the land rest. You had to respect how much it had given you, and you had to let it rest. You couldn't replant your crops in that part that had given you so much. You had to free all your slaves, give them that option, or of either to be freed or to stay with you. There was that respect for others. But there was also the counseling of all debts. And as we go into a global reset of what, what's valuable, uh, we have a chance to rethink economics. The, for the first time in, in my memory, so much on how we care for the earth, et cetera. So frankly, in 50 years, we didn't do so well. Uh, we're more polluted, more species eroded, uh, uh, lost a, a third of our uh, agricultural lands, et cetera. But this exhibition, and I think there's uh, two classes of first and second graders joining us too. So we have all ages with us today and from really uh, across uh, at least the pond. And I'm so happy that we're here together today. I only learned last night that Michael Moore, the great documentary a filmmaker, uh, created a film called Planet of the Humans, and it will premiere tonight for free on YouTube. So let's watch that also together later it's in our own homes. And I hope you're all well out there. My amazing staff joins me in, in wishing you well. And uh, just to say, when we do reopen, we're going to extend the secret life of Earth into January of 2021. And we really hope that you will be inspired from what you see today to actually uh, join us in person in the flesh. But until then, happy Earth Day. May it be a, a better world with every day. And let's not forget the, the Chinese kids who never saw the stars in Beijing before this incredible stillness had to come and they could see from no pollution in the sky. 
the stars for the first time. So it's a lot of blessings, happy spring, and very happy Earth Day. And this is my introduction to our exhibition, The Secret Life of Earth, just in time for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So I want to first thank you for giving me a reason to get out of bed and dress and make up. Um, but I hope every one of you out there are hunkering down safely and happily. And please enjoy the secret life of Earth. I hope you're going to come and see this very important, beautiful show um, that will now be extended into the first month through January of 2021. Again, our one planet, this is it. Come tour with me, the secret life of Earth. Thank you so much. The very first thing we encounter, courtesy, an image on a huge screen from the Goddard Space Flight Institute shows the year of uh, 2017. And what you're most struck by are the billowing clouds of smoke from the forest fires in California. We can only imagine the burden in our atmosphere of smoke from the Brazil mega fires, as well as Australia. Then you see the dust that comes from the Sahara and it gives nutrients to the rainforest in South America. And then you look up and in our long entry hall, you see hanging from the ceiling, all of these plastic things that have washed up on Point Reyes Beach in Northern California. All of this plastic was collected in just weeks of time by going out by a couple named Judith and Richard Lang, who have a wonderful film called One Plastic Beach. We may have five different names for oceans, but it is but one interactive body of water. There is no way when we throw something. So we have then the history of plastic, which was actually invented in 1856, but it really didn't get going uh, until the 1950s in America, when a way of manufacturing plastic became so cheap, it invaded our lives in every way. You get up to the head of our ramp, you have my introduction, and then you see my friend Trump's uh, um, Hollingsworth's wonderful uh, commentary. It's a question about our being and what kind of life we will live. We make the turn uh, on the first floor and we come across an exuberant installation uh, that features the work of two artists. One is Pat Bernstein, who was able, after a brain tumor, he felt for the first time the trees come forth and almost hug her. And everywhere she looked, she could see faces. And it is called pareidolia. Then we have the work of Brian Pardini, who has walked like a meditation, the shores of Lake Erie, for more than three decades. And he spots these little bits that have washed up on the shore of all sorts of things, identical to things you would recognize right away with no manipulation. You come around the corner, you see the beautiful paper cut flowers of Erica uh, Eskin, and what a gift she has been to Baltimore with her candy. No audio. Fantastic fungi. Louis Schwartzberg. We also have three secrets selected by Frank Warren, our great friend who created the Post Secret Project. 
onto our second floor, you see uh, framed by twigs, a beautiful print uh, by um, you know, uh, Montenegro, who had the, the wisdom, he juxtaposed the tree ring with a human thumbprint. And then we have a bat skeleton. And you see the like five little toes and the rib cage and the head, and you realize how much like a little miniature person that bat is. Then we have a tribute to what the Shinto priests have long known was such an incredible uh, sacred tree. All Shinto shrines have to be made from Polonia. It's this miracle tree that can grow in almost no soil. And it can grow five to, get this, 20 feet in one year, the first year. It consumes 11 times more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than any other tree. And we have the sculptures of a, a turtle and a dog made by Abraham Lincoln Chris out of the root material of the Polonia. We round the corner, and the first thing that we see is this large wall. And it's the story of William Hall, one of the most magical artists who was not discovered until very late in life, who had lived with his mom in California into his 50s. And when she died, he couldn't afford to stay in his home. So he ended up living in his car for 11 years where he did these magnificent, complex drawings, combining his love of cars and technology, as well as with nature and trees. And we say care for Earth and each other. The artist, Stephen Holman, married to a wonderful woman, a little boy, came across one day, William, and said, live with us, we'll be your family. Up in our niche, you see this ball gown, more beautiful than any you've ever seen, called Birds of Prey, embroidered by Chris Roberts Antio. Next to that, we have the magic uh, behind the glow of fireflies. And I'll let you come and see what that secret is. Then the grand entry to the main exhibition floor looks like a giant bower bird nest. You know, those hipster bachelors of the bird community who build these incredible nests, each one of a kind, trying to entice the ladybirds to choose them. And like a blessing on the whole show, we have the original work by Dr. Bob Hieronymus for the Earth Day uh, poster that has the Earth Day message done in almost every written language. The original Earth Day celebration was to be the spring equinox, but for political reasons, it was changed to April 20th. Further, you come in and you see these uh, stacks of shoes that have all been hand-painted by Rick Scobsberg. And they're in fractals found in nature and other scenes. And we have juxtaposed that with the uh, quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, walk as if your feet are kissing the earth. Then we learn that our human eyeballs are hardwired to see more variation in the color green than any other color. And no better buffet of green could be Johanna Burke's life-size green monkeys. Human beings share uh, more than 98% of our DNA with chimps and bonobos. There's a lot of our behaviors that are also similar. Like they have a great sense of injustice. And then you look over and you see the great visionary artist, Alex Graves, original planetary prayer. So one thing that we can all think about this spring is how many of you have ever noticed how happy bird song sounds in spring. Usually it's the males who are singing, and there's been research done that's really intriguing. 
that if you uh, put a control seed with the same amount of light and uh, water, etc., and the only thing you change is you play recording of these happy spring bird songs, you will find again and again that those seeds will grow exponentially larger than their controls, almost as if the birds are like the cheerleaders of nature. That's part one of this four-part virtual tour that I hope will encourage you to come and experience uh, the secret life of Earth on your own. So that is, as Rebecca said, just a taste. So we're now going to open up the floor to questions. Um, and Rebecca, we have a first question come in. Um, and just a reminder, if you're joining us, um, that you're welcome to type in your questions into the chat box. And you can find that by moving your mouse either to the top or bottom of your screen and you'll see a button pop up that says chat. Click on that and you can begin typing. And we'll be monitoring that and then relaying those questions to Rebecca. We'll get to as many as that we can. Um, so our first one is, what are the green monkeys made of? Oh, I, I'm hoping we have the genius Johanna Burke right there to, to give an answer. Uh, is that possible, Helen, that we could switch to her? It's, it's both natural things and, and tons of bling and incredible imagination and care. But if Johanna is on the, the, uh, with us, Johanna Burke, I don't know if there's some way she can raise her hand or anything in this. Um, we can have her explain that. Is that possible? Um, if, I'm searching for her now and do you I want? am, okay, unmute. There we go. Hi. Oh, yay! <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be put on the spot there. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> At least you have well, clothes this, on. <laughs> We do have, um, jo this is Johanna Burke, the artist um, with us this morning who created the, um, who created the Green Monkeys. Uh, did you wanna say a few words? Um, so what was the question was about what the materials are? Yes, what are the Green Monkeys made out of? So they are, um, they're made of mostly dry natural materials, so like um, preserved grasses and flowers and, um, oh my gosh, it's been like, and mosses and things like that. And then probably there's a small percentage of ha that has vintage sparkles in there that I get in the garment district in New York, and we mix those in so that for definition. Um, and Joanna, I have a quick follow-up question. Do you consider yourself a mosaic artist? Um, I do. I don't work exclusively as mosaic, but definitely, yes. Um, I don't work in one specific material though, so, but as far as like arranging things into, you know, excited, patterns that excite me that I do that a lot. So yes. Um, well, Can I come in here as I wanted to just say um, for the teachers and people of families or grandchildren, whatever, people of any age will be gobsmacked by these monkeys made, these green monkeys. Uh, but I think for children, it will be the kind of thing that they remember for the rest of their lives. Think back to that one, experience in a museum that you that absolutely changed your life you know that you looked at and you just loved so much and i i have to thank joanna again for the gift of sharing these uh monkeys with us uh they've been such a joy and again when you're outside everybody begin to look at how many greens you can count in just the short walk to your mailbox 
for example, or, or as you go down into a park. Uh, it is, again, our, our, our eyes are hardwired to perceive more little bit of variation, subtle variation in green than any other color. I know I said that in the movie, but I wanted you to really get that. And we have Melissa there wearing her green fascinator uh, up there <laughs> that she wore to Earth Day. Again, thank you, Johanna. And I'm sorry, I caught you off guard, but you look beautiful even without the makeup at all. Thank um, you. <laughs> thank you, Joanne. We're really, really blessed and honored that you joined us this morning. What is an amazing treat for our audience to meet you. Um, and guess what, audience? We have Richard and Judith Selby Lang with us as well. Um, so with their permission, um, I'm going to also unmute them and you're welcome to ask them a question or um, Rebecca, is that all right if the two, sure. you, know, you and the Lang speak a little bit more about the plastic installation? All right, so let me find them again. Okay, can I speak in the interim? Does yes. it work? Okay. Yes, please, um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that now they say that human beings, this is hard to imagine, digest a credit card worth of plastic a week. A week. I thought it was like a month. No, it's it's so intense. The microfibers, how, you know, the great thing about wearing masks all the time is we're going to use less lipstick. And so much of <laughs> lipstick, you know, uh, has on it, has within it like plastic. They say that there is no baby now born anywhere on the planet <laughs> that if you didn't look at the cordal blood under a microscope, you wouldn't see microplastic. So in just 70 years of manufacture of plastic, we, we've so profoundly changed our own genome, uh, that of all sea life, et cetera. Um, remember in the parenting show, you may remember that we brought up um, the fact that there are plastic chemicals in a lot of the foaming uh, shaving cream. And as men make uh, sperm every 72 days in an internal process, if indeed they're shaving uh, with that particular kind of foaming cream that has that kind of chemical burden, it will enter the, the bloodstream and it will actually disrupt the DNA. So it's not just all on the mother. You know, we, we have done so much to compromise this world chemically. So two heroes here, Judith and Richard, thank you for what you Good have morning. long done. Hello. <laughs> You can't go on your beach now, right? Yeah, it, it, right, closed. it's closed. Yeah, the whole Point Reyes National Seashore is closed, as is access to Kehoe Beach. So we're very eager to get back out and see what has happened during this interim time. But for now, we are cleaning and organizing our collection and getting ready for our next opportunity to uh, participate in the world with the plastic. You'll have to um, make a trip. I can't believe to see how glorious the work looks. It's, it's even hard to tell. <laughs> Any questions for the lines? Ellen? Um, we don't yet have any questions in the chat room, although um, I am curious, what have you found lately on the beach? Well, let's see. I just want to, though, in the chat, there's a couple of things that are worthy of note. I see that Jeff Greenwald has put a link to a wonderful article about us that he wrote for Smithsonian Magazine. Oh. I would encourage people to uh, click on that at, after this, this program is over. And um, what have we found lately that's well, you know, we are always intrigued. We, okay, so as you can tell, we could all fall into a pit of despair as Rebecca describes how infinitesimal the, the problem is and how gargantuan the problem is. So when we go to the beach, we try to make it into a game. We say that we're not cleaning the beach, we're curating the beach and we go out with the intention to have fun. And what we love about our installation at the museum is that Rebecca and her team makes it look really beautiful and really fun. There is that cobalt blue ceiling and the dazzling sparkle of these brilliant colors against that 
sky. So it may be as if you're looking deep into the ocean or you're looking at the constellations in the sky. It's a really marvelous uh, expression of what's going on in the planet. We have a question. Our good friend Sarge Salmon said, Do you, have you weighed what you have collected through the years or have an, uh, any idea? Um, it's, it's close to 6,000 pounds. Wow. We argue about it quite a bit. <laughs> we argue about everything, <laughs> which, is, which is the great fun. Um, it must, so, must make confine, uh, quarantine tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're low. <laughs> we have plenty of plastic and plenty to do while we're here. <laughs> okay, thank you both. Much love to California. Um, Rebecca, we have one um, in general. Um, which is, what do you recommend people fight for to make an impact? The biggest thing I believe we should fight for, and it is in this show, is that the, the largest investment we have been making for decades is in uh, defense spending and in defense intelligence. There's a lot of creative minds that are harnessed to chemical warfare, biological warfare, uh, conventional more weaponry, et cetera. And what I'd like to see is to uh, a more honest look at what are the absolute greatest threats. We're seeing pandemic. I don't want to see it um, uh, just put in the hands of CDC. I don't want the plastic pollution just to be an EPA thing because uh, I, I want to go where the greatest concentration of, of intelligence and funding is. And I just read, it's on their website, the DOD um, is getting the biggest budget in their entire history. And nowhere do they mention, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we have an electrical grid, an antiquated electrical grid, the same one our grandparents, you know, had, uh, that is highly hackable. So, um, the, the whole issue of, of cleaning. And unfortunately, the defense industry has so many good, well-intended people, but I'd like to see it be um, weapons into plowshares on steroids uh, and harness those creative minds and funding to be a SWAT team to help clean up this, this world. The defense industry, not just ours, all over, has disproportionately polluted with uh, chemical uh, chemicals as well as um, atomic radioactive materials. So I'd like us to really take this time in which, um, you know, we've already had so many haves and have nots, right? Uh, the disparity in income has never been greater than in the last couple decades. And that's uh, now with this pandemic, we're going to see that go Nova, people who were secure, you know, on, um, uh, as middle class and uh, even upper middle class, a lot of that will now shift, shift. So I think that it's an incredibly positive opportunity um, for us to look at how we interact with the earth, each other, uh, and to do what the original proclamation of, of Earth Day set out. Um, so I think that uh, there are many people rethinking what is truly of value. And um, thank you. And we have also a question about Brian Pardini's amazing cowboy boot. And um, someone was wondering, is that really untouched? Oh, yeah, yeah, the thing is Brian right there because he will assemble uh, things, but he doesn't like he doesn't even poke another eye in when there's a creature with a face. I mean, uh, his work is endlessly fascinating. Um, is, is Brian on the chat? Um, I am searching for him and I do not see him. Patty is his partner. There may be, he may be on her computer. Um, I see Patty Kuzbita. Oh, yay! <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's um, our, our what, uh, what Me Worry uh, bed and so much more. Oh, Patty, I miss you. Okay. Um, we do have a few more questions for the length, if they wouldn't mind entertaining them. Sure. Sure. Um, so what is the most common thing that you find on the beach, and how do you organize your collection? Shotgun wads. <laughs> 
shotgun wads are the most common thing, which is the piece of plastic that's inside of a shotgun shell uh, that holds the BBs together when you fire a shot. And we find them by the hundreds. And there has not been a day we've gone to the beach where we don't find shotgun wads. Now, they used to be made of paper. Mm -hmm. And now they're made of plastic. And you may wonder why so many. Well, uh, hunting, duck hunting, bird hunting happens up in the Sacramento Delta, the Russian River area, in these waterways. And uh, we are reminded that everything flows to the sea. So uh, the question of what, what can people do, uh, you, you start right where you are, in your gutter, in front of your apartment. There are bits of plastic, and then the choices that we make every day have a tremendous impact. So you may not be a hunter, but you may be a straw user, or you may be, uh, uh, there's, there's unfortunately this terrible thing happening with the plastic bags right now, and we're tremendously distressed about all of the efforts that people have made to shift to reusable bags. And now suddenly markets are not uh, allowing people to bring their reusable bags in, and, and we're deeply concerned about this rollback of something that we've all fought for for such a long time. Thank you. Um, that's just such a great message on this Earth Day. Um, and we have a question about the amazing polonia tree. And just they were fascinated to learn that it's such a miracle tree. So would you mind talking a little bit more about that? And is anyone uh, planting them widely since they do so good, so much good? You know, uh, there's, um, there's something called the World Tree Organization up in Nova Scotia, and they provide seedlings for farmers all over. I could speak uh, for 20 minutes on the glories, besides the fact that they consume 11 times more carbon dioxide. The most in amazing thing that in 10 years, you can get um, a, a crop uh, to log, and the, the, the weight of a polonia is about that of balsam wood, but it's three times stronger than pine. So it makes this incredible renewable uh, building material. Um, the leaves themselves have so much protein in them, they can be fed to cattle. Uh, when they fall on the ground, they reinvigorate denuded soil. Um, it is uh, insect resistant. I mean, it, I can see why the Shintos make it their most sacred, uh, you know, tree. Uh, all shrines must be built out of them. And even the soles of the shoes of the Shinto priests are made out of polonia. Um, many places, including Baltimore City, classify the 23 species as all invasive. Um, but actually, now we know from the, uh, the fossil record that they were part of America at one point. Um, now they're kind of everywhere, um, but there are uh, only one of the 23 species is considered invasive. So go to the World uh, Tree Organization. And uh, yes, I know of several Maryland um, uh, polonia farms. And uh, if you go up to Longwood Gardens, when that reopens, they have over a 120 year alley of the most beautiful polonia trees with the incredible uh, purple blossoms that come out in May. Um, but you'll see them growing out of roofs and gutters. They need almost no soil to be born. So polonia is spelled uh, P-A-U-L, like Paul, L, you know, L-O-W-N-I-A, Polonia. I, I'm a freak for it, because you can tell. Um, that's, that's exciting and um, it's such great, you know, great work that people are doing um, with the Polonia tree. Are there any other questions? Um, we're, I'm just looking at the time, so we only have time for a few more. Um, so I'll give people time to type their questions in. Um, I did see I one. Wanna, I just really want to say, I, you know, I can't thank you all for enough for tuning in today because I, 
it just is, it, it brings me enormous joy to be with you all. And so many of our docents are, who, who are so selfless in the tours, and I'm thinking every one of them said, oh, I could do a better job. Uh, but I was um, a, a sparing the great volunteer effort to record my voice. Um, I recorded for an hour and mercifully Helen edited. So we said a lot more about a lot of things, but you've just seen a little bit of the secret life of Earth in this first film. There are three more parts. And again, I hope we can all be together in person soon enough. Rebecca, I have a question from George Sissel. Um, you may all know him um, in the art world. <laughs> uh, he says, every AVAM show that has exhibited turns out to be extremely contemporary in the urgent issue it focuses its artwork around. Has the pandemic provided you with what will be the next relevant topic? Well, actually, The Secret Life of Earth is very entwined with pandemic because it's loss of habitat uh, that uh, is a contributing force to when these viruses that were confined to wild species make the leap. And uh, that is one of the reasons. Then the other thing is the permafrost uh, uh, that we also talked about uh, in this, um, in the Secret Life of Earth, there's a whole section on soil. And uh, what you, you find is that uh, with uh, parts of the permafrost, um, uh, um, you know, uh, thawing, you had a, a small boy that a year and a half ago um, found these um, uh, reindeer that had been covered over from who had died of anthrax and he was poking them with a stick and he went back and he brought that those little particles and besides the little boy the entire village in Siberia died uh, in Alaska there were chil there were people who were buried um, under ice uh, from the um, uh, the 1918 um, pandemic uh, and uh, it has been seen that their bodies now, their, what's left, has been uncovered. So we're living in a time where we have to be um, so aware of what we have done uh, to pollute particularly native lands. So often we, we throw our, our filthy uranium mining, detritus, et cetera, uh, on, on Native American territories, et cetera. Um, and just illness and the earth, you can't corrupt the earth uh, without consequence. And uh, so, no, I wouldn't do a show um, just on pandemic, but I think, uh, George, because you're so smart too, that um, we can make clearer uh, through our earth exhibition, the relationship that pandemics um, are, are more likely to continue to, to uh, proliferate, unfortunately, um, and how human beings can also work to be aware of that and to be less destructive and invasive. Um, I was just sent an article on how many, uh, by John Shields, our great head of docents, and um, uh, just, you know, that a third of, of the bird kingdom uh, has gone in just, just the past a, a few decades. Um, we have lost so many species. Um, the white rhino is featured in our show, you know, because the last male white rhino died out uh, just the year before uh, we opened. So, um, but, but thank you. And we have a few questions about um, resources. I believe I saw one from a teacher. We have at least two teachers I saw in the chat room joining us today, yay! Um, and they were just asking about teacher resources and our director of education is on um, the chat and um, but you know quickly they're available on our website if you just click on a link that says for educators um, you can find some uh, curriculum um, assistance there teaching uh, and lesson plans um, 
and from and really little kids to all all the way through correct and bilingual we were so blessed to have mavet here and we have put um some of our workshops that parents could do at home with the kids etc um have been uh, interpreted uh you know in in spanish has been translated into spanish so beautifully so um you know that's a, that's important and they're also uh closed captioned so if you have hearing impaired students all of that's available and um and then we have another question about um when the subsequent three parts of the remaining of remaining in the series will be released and those will be in the subsequent subsequent weeks um and included in that will be we had a question about bobby adams installation oh, yeah, yeah and if that will be featured and the answer is yes <laughs> absolutely absolutely and we i mean you we haven't done anything with judy tallwing and uh peter eglinton there's so much to say uh, many of you, we had uh, almost 500 people registered to come to our March 22nd Revada Foundation Logan Visionary Conference uh, uh, with an incredible uh, you know, lineup of speakers. And we tentatively uh, assigned August 2nd. We've got all the speakers, Judy Butterfly Hill, you know, such great champions of this earth. But um, our, our honoree, our principal honoree, uh, Louis Schwartzberg, you saw a little bit of his work uh, just Google anything, um, I think particularly his gratitude movies. But if you got to see Fantastic Fungi, that's Louis's work. Um, so he has been a great friend to our museum and uh, when hopefully he will be our keynote on August 2nd. I'll keep you know, in touch with our, our uh, you know, website to see whether that can come off. We also have Pablo Suarez, who is the um, Red Cross as well as the UN climate scientist and just an incredible lineup of, of, of visionaries and activists in the environment. Uh, and that, you know, to further flesh out um, the understanding of our Earth. Um, so we have time for just one final question. So I'll give a few more minutes for people to think about that and type in their question. Um, I did see one about um, what is a favorite piece of yours. Um, I, I ain't going there. It's like <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to tell you, I, I like love so much and I don't love in, in silos in general. So for me, it's how the, spe the pieces speak to each other, you know, that makes the exhibition so rich. It's not just like, oh, this person's now their idea of the earth and relationship, you know, after another. It's, it's, it's a chorus that makes that beauty for everybody. I'm not just being PC. I, I really mean that. <laughs> um, Rebecca, do you have, um, I see one question about painting classes for kids, um, and we do offer workshops year-round, so you can look out for those. We have several art workshops online right now on our YouTube video, on our YouTube channel, excuse me, as well as from our website. So if you go to avam.org, that's A-V-A-M dot org, then you'll see a link to several art workshops created by our amazing education team, um, Becca Plum, Director of Education, and Mavet Rosas. Yeah, and um, I was going to say with Pat Bernstein, uh, she has been doing these glorious uh, tours with schools and the VA, and we're collaborating with the Irvine Nature Center uh, to really do these walks where you actually experience what she and Brian Pardini experience in that the abundance of pareidolia, and not to go through, you know, plugged in, etc. And again, um, even Kyle Yearwood, the, the Baltimore filmmaker who's whose happiest thing growing up was his little backyard going down to a creek. You know, we're really wanting people to uh, get back in touch with what made them happiest, uh, particularly in nature, to give them strength through this time. So that's all the time that we have for today. Um, I apologize 
really uh, if we weren't able to get to your question. Um, Rebecca, would you like to say a few parting words and uh, reiterate again about the August 2nd conference? We had a couple of questions about that. Just um, if you could repeat that information. Because no one knows when we'll be uh, legally, you know, uh, uh, and rightfully able to open up safely for everyone again. So um, we we won't know. We won't make that decision to the early July when we have to start uh, booking the flights. Um, but uh, stay tuned to you know avam.org, and you can really um, you know uh, just log on. It will be free. Uh, to all, uh, grace of, uh, of of Dan and Gloria uh, Logan and the Ravada Foundation, um, and we bring in the Rolls Royce of experts every year that um, magnify the learning from the, whatever theme that we're exploring in that year. And so, the Secret Life of Earth. Um, it this is the first time we've ever not withdrawn our major exhibition of the year on on uh, Labor Day, but this time for economic reasons, but also I think because we wanted just this most gorgeous show. And when they said about favorites, I have to say every year, um, there are a few things that I, I am like desperate to be able to include. And this year it was Johanna's uh, Green Monkeys. From the moment I saw them, I was smitten because I realized you know, the, the influence they would have, but there's so much more um, uh, for you to check out and with a lot of surprises in this exhibition. So um, until then, thank you for just getting a little taste and for Helen for your editing and all my staff for all you do all the time. And to everybody out there, I cannot wait till we can be together again. Thank, thank you, you thank everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone. I did see another question about Kinetic Sculpture Race. Um, we will be doing a virtual ode to that, so you can look out for that in our e-newsletter and on our website. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Again, this program is being recorded and will be available um, later on our YouTube channel. So happy, happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs> thank you.